and I'm going to let him introduce his wife, and Terry is readjusting. I hope he's turning it up. He. <laughs> really? Okay. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I think I first came here in 20, it must have been 2018 or 19, uh, when you were without a pastor. Um, and just to check out the church a little bit, someone had called and uh, need, said you were in need of a pastor, and I told him I wasn't um, interested in being a pastor myself. I wasn't called to being a pastor, but as an evangelist, I thought I would come over and check out the church to see what kind of doctrine they were espousing and so forth. And then, and having passed my seal of approval for whatever reason, and then I was uh, welcome to kind of help you find a pastor. And uh, one of, Brother Trahan is one of the people that I contacted, and I'm glad that's worked out. It's a blessing to see not only more bodies in the pews this morning for Sunday school, but also a pianist. Yeah. It's the first time I've been here that you've had a piano player, and I praise the Lord for that. So this is going to be a really different Sunday school this morning. Uh, if you're like me and you watch the news, and this is my wife Diana, by the way, so she's very shy like I am, but uh, um, anyway, um, I'm only introduced her because he said I would. So uh, I hope to get to know you a little bit better, maybe between the services or afterward. But that being said, um, this, if you're like me and watch the news at all, it could be very discouraging. It's discouraging to me. And as I travel around the country, which I've been doing for 17 years now, full time, um, I get this feedback from all kinds of Christians, and that is this country, our country, is falling apart. And it is discouraging. But I would encourage you, if you know your Bible, to put a little different perspective on what we're experiencing right here in this country right now. And if you know your Bible, then you can say, well, it may be falling apart, but in a way it's really coming together, right. or falling together, if you want to put it that way. And with that perspective in mind, I think it's more encouraging. You know, hey, this is, pre this is prophesied in our Bible, what's going to happen during these last days, and that's what we're in. So we shouldn't be surprised. So this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 7, and this is going to be more of a history lesson than anything else. And I don't know if you've seen this or not. I don't know if you've ever heard of history referred to as his story. <laughs> but that's what this book is all about. It is his story. Now, this, I think the main theme of this Bible, if you're a Bible believer, is kings and kingdoms and all that. But the, we're talking about the king, the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is his story. Um, someone gave me this particular Bible. Um, I've never preached a message out of it before. It's a King James Bible. It's called an American Patriots Bible. And if you're at all interested in history, which I'm really not, uh, and that's the reason I didn't look at it for a year or so, but um, this is a King James Bible, and sprinkled throughout it are all kind of tidbits about different periods and different quotes from our founding fathers up into current day statesmen and presidents and so forth. It's all about our, our American history sprinkled into the Bible at very appropriate places. So this morning is going to be more of a history lesson about our country because the first thing I want to say is that foundations are very important. If you're in Matthew chapter 7, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew 7. So I've used this Bible for different references and stuff. I haven't preached actually using this Bible before, but I'm going to attempt to do it today. Matthew 7 um, we'll begin in verse 24. This is Jesus Christ. Uh, he's winding up his, his sermon on the mount here. And uh, he says in verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where three, uh, thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust can, doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, I'm a Bible believer. 
I'm a dispensationalist. I rightly divide the word of God, the word of truth. I hope you do too. I know this is the Sermon on the Mount, but what we've just read there, those first three verses, even though this is the Sermon on the Mount, doctrinally, I would say uh, we don't want to get our doctrine out of this section of Scripture necessarily, but what we just read there is totally compatible with what the Apostle Paul preaches, and that is that we are to set our affection on things above, not on the things of this earth, right? And so this is good doctrinal stuff. This is compatible with our doctrine. Verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore, uh, now I'm in verse 6, obviously chapter 6, the wrong, the wrong verse. I'm not used to this Bible, excuse me. Let's go right to chapter 7. I don't know why the Lord had me segue over there. But here's where I want to be. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, this is Jesus Christ winding up the Sermon on the Mount. And he is saying to his disciples and the others that are he's preaching to, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. I want to, the, the thing I'm going for here in the Sunday school, I'm going to talk about our country and the fact that our country was founded on biblical principles. Now, you talk to somebody in their 30s or younger, and they will question that. And maybe people even older than that, because they've been educated out of that belief system. But I'm here, I'm going to be quoting a lot of what our founding fathers said. And I'll put it this way. Our founding fathers were, were definitely not all Bible believers, but they all agreed to the basic what we call the Judeo-Christian ethic, those seven principles, and I'll get into in a minute. They all agreed to those, and they are the foundation, the framework for what this country was, how this country was established. So, verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, very important, not enough just to hear the principles in this book, but to do those principles. I will liken him unto what? A wise man which built his house upon a rock. And then when if the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Very interesting because we know that our faith hopefully is founded upon the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the rock. Uh, verse 26, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So the contrast there is the contrast between uh, really a wise man and a foolish man. And the difference is their foundations. The, the wise man, if he has the fear of the Lord, uh, well, a wise man just building a physical structure like a house makes sure that the foundation is, is sure, is steady, is a rock. Not just sand, the shifting sand, but something stable like a rock. So in this Bible, there's a quote here. It's a quote from someone you may have never heard of. I never had heard of this guy. His name is Robert Winthrop. He's a lawyer, was a lawyer. He lived in the 1850s, uh, is when he spoke this anyway. He spoke this in 1850. He was a U.S. House of Representatives, uh, speaker of the United States House of Representatives back in the uh, 1850s, right before the Civil War. And this is what he said. I'm going to actually paraphrase some of it. These guys back then, I could read this for you, some of, and I will read some of exactly what he wrote, but sometimes their language is so flowery, it's kind of hard to follow. So I, this first paragraph was very important, but I paraphrased it. Basically what he said is, experience and common sense and reason have shown that any civilized society needs to be founded, talking about your foundation, on virtue and morality. Okay, And the only valid authority for those things, that virtue and morality, is the word of God. Okay, This guy said this 170 years ago. And then he quotes here, All societies of men must be governed in some way or other. Right? Common sense. The less they have of stringent state government, the more they must have of individual self-government. Now listen, this Bible has told us that at our core, what does it say? All of sin and come short of the glory of God. There is uh, none righteous, no, not one. When, when God sent that flood uh, in Genesis, 
uh, I don't know if that was Genesis 8, uh, but it says there somewhere in there, I don't know if Genesis 6 or Genesis 8, but the reason God sent the flood, he said that he saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's basically who we are, okay? At our core nature, you might think you're a good person, but that's not biblical, okay? Without the Lord Jesus Christ and without these Christian principles, we devolve very quickly. And that's what you're seeing, and that's really the difference what's going on in this country, is that the people that don't believe in God, really, as a rule, it's people that don't believe in God, that don't have a moral and ethical foundation, and not trying to live according to these principles, and it's very difficult because they don't have the Lord Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit living inside of them. They are displaying what their normal tendencies would be for any of us, okay? So I'm not trying to get into your political persuasions or any of that, but that's what's going on in this country. So he says this, all societies of men must be governed in some way or other. The less they have of stringent state government, the more they must have of individual self-government. The less they rely on public law or physical force, the, uh, the more they must rely on private moral restraint. Where do you get that private moral restraint from? You get it from not just knowing about it, but the fact that if you're born again and you have the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, that encourages you and helps you to put down the old man, so to speak. Just because you got born again, that doesn't mean you didn't lose that old man. We've got an old man that's sin nature, and that those two, that new man is doing battle against that old man continually. He goes on to say, men in a word must necessarily be controlled either by a power within them or a power without them, talking about the government, either by the word of God or by the strong arm of man, either by the Bible or by the bayonet. <laughs> he goes on finally to say, it may do for other countries and other governments to talk about the state supporting religion but here, under our own free institutions, it is religion which must support the state. And now that's not, that's not like a legal thing, but that's just a general principle. And the more uh, that this country is steeped in Christianity and Christian principles, the longer this government will last. And what we're seeing now is the decay of all of that. And it's happening very quickly. And I'll be honest with you, I don't mean to depress anybody, but it's my understanding from what I've read, and especially in the book of Revelation, that all nations are going to turn their back on God and the nation of Israel. All nations. It says that word, all nations, three times in the book of Revelation. So, you know, we think, well, we're in a country that's really special. And this country is special, and it's special to God. God had his purpose for... Uh, establishing this country, and we'll get into that in a minute. So, um, let me look at these seven biblical principles. We call them the Judeo-Christian ethic. It's at the beginning of this thing. First principle. The dignity of human life. Okay? That's one of the seven Judeo-Christian what the world calls the Judeo Christian ethic. It's a combination of the, the biblical principles that come from the Old and New Testament. That's why they call it Judeo Christian. All right? The dignity of human life. Now, I can give you scriptures for all of these. Uh, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to have you look them up. But we know that in Exodus 20, it says, Thou shalt not kill. We know in Matthew 22, he says, Love thy neighbor as thyself. The dignity of human life, it says, is the first principle of any civilized society. But let's take that principle of uh, the dignity of human life to its fullest extent. That would apply to not only the born, but the unborn. So if you've got any questions about is abortion right or wrong, this Bible tells you clearly it's not man's place to decide when someone lives or dies. It's, it's cut and dried, really, and sometimes difficult decisions, but that's Bible. Um, it says here that the Declaration of Independence uh, from our Founding Fathers mentioned unalienable rights, and those rights were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, is there any accident that the United States of America 
sends its own military to foreign countries to defend the rights and the lives of those that are threatened. No, I mean, I know that politically there's all kinds of other things going on with these wars, and it gets into all kinds of things, not just politics, but the love of money is the root of all evil and all of that. But the number one principle, the dignity of human life. Number two, the traditional monogamous family. Now, in Genesis 2, the Bible says, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's the principle of the monogamous family. It says the plan of God, nature, and common sense, those three things, the plan of God, nature, and common sense is a man and a woman producing children within the institution of marriage. How far have we strayed from that? When that plan is lost, marriage and family become meaningless, and a nation and its people will follow the road to ruin. World history has proven, world history has proven this over and over again, that preserving the traditional family is vital to the future of any great nation. Uh, I've been told that um, Norway, I'm Norwegian, and I've been told that Norway is like 20 years advanced materialistically than the United States. And, you know, one of the things they do is they have a state religion. It's Lutheranism, by the way. L uh, the Lutheran denomination is their state religion. But our, and 98% of the, the country is, quote, unquote, Lutheran, but like 90% of the country doesn't go to church. They almost don't believe in marriage anymore in Norway. Very few people, there's no, you know, and, and of course our country's headed that way as well. Um, you know, the other thing about history, unfortunately, men seldom learn from history. The only thing men learn from history is that men seldom learn from history. Boy, we've been given his story, we've been given history to learn from it. And I know it's easier, uh, more effective sometimes to learn from our own mistakes, but if we can learn from the mistakes of others, it's a much sweeter learning. Unfortunately, we're hard-headed, and sometimes we have to learn from our own failures. But I mean, this is a cycle that repeats itself over and over again. Our country is a very unusual government, this democratic or republic government, whatever you want to call it. And it's amazing it has survived as long as it has. And by the way, I could read quotes from George Washington to Abraham Lincoln to Ronald Reagan. All throughout our history, all of these leaders have said, our country is so strong mightily, it will never be destroyed from without. In other words, no foreign enemy is ever going to take down this country. But all of those men, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan, all of those presidents in between have warned about this country being taken down from within. And again, that's exactly what we're seeing today. And it's going to happen. Don't let it discourage you. Let it encourage you knowing that the time is short. We're in these perilous last days. And let's take advantage of the liberty we still have. Okay, so dignity of human life, uh, traditional monogamous family. Principle number three is a national work ethic. Uh, we know from 2 Thessalonians 3 that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Listen, this may be kind of a uh, not so much stated fact, but it says here, and I'll just kind of read some of it, the American spirit, which is the desire to give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. This independent spirit has no desire to simply exist on handouts from government or depend on the generosity of others. It is the same independent spirit that has allowed America to create the greatest and strongest economy in the world. Generations were raised, our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, generations were raised to believe in this third principle of honest work, which is found throughout the Word of God. We've strayed from that one as well. Principle number four, the right to a God-centered education. Quote from uh, George Washington here. It is impossible to rightly govern the word, the world, without God and the Bible. I don't know what you think of John, uh, George Washington, whether he was a deist or whether he was a saved man. Again, they adhered to these principles. They knew the importance of this Bible and God. Do you realize that Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Dartmouth were all founded by Christian preachers or churches with the specific uh, purpose of becoming seminaries, so to speak, to raise others up in the faith? Here's a, in 1636, when Harvard was actually founded, 
they adopted these rules and precepts, which, quote, let every student, this is in the Harvard's precepts from over almost 400 years ago, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well that the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. I mean, I, they would be floored if they read this to the student body there. Are you kidding me? That's what that place was founded on. Harvard's original seal has upon it these words, truth for Christ and the church. But it wasn't just higher education. Uh, keep in mind, back in the 1600s, 1700s, most people were illiterate. Most people didn't even know how to read back then, and they were beginning to learn how to read. You know, they had the printing press, I think, was developed in around 16, early 1600s with this, uh, came kind of coincided with the um, printing of the King James Bible. So it might have been a little before the Bible was printed on it, but it, right around that time. And what people, what they were learning is they were learning to read in homes in this country from a Bible. And all they had back then in English was a King James Bible, the very Bible that we use in this church. Back then, the New England primer taught the ABCs by having children memorize A in Adam's fall, we sinned all. B, heaven to find the Bible mind. It went through the alphabet like that. As they're learning the ABCs, they're learning the Bible and biblical principles. Uh, fourth, that was the fourth principle. Fifth principle, the Abrahamic covenant. And that's, of course, Abraham uh, believed God, obeyed his word, and God rewarded him with many descendants, a nation of people now known as Israel. Of course, we know part of that covenant says, I will make of thee a great nation. That's what the Lord told Abraham. He also said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. So the principle of the Abrahamic covenant states that if a person or nation obeys God, observing the moral truths found in the Bible, that person or nation will be blessed. And that's what happened in this country. If they disobey, they will bring punishment upon themselves. Then he mentions this, uh, he quotes this verse here in Galatians 3.7, not George Washington, but this, the writer who put this together. Uh, Galatians 3.7 says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So uh, this has got to all to do with uh, understanding the principles of this, in this Bible. One issue is just the fear of the Lord. And if you're God-fearing, then you will try, especially from the help of the Holy Spirit inside of us, to live according to these principles. And that's what separates a, uh, a God-fearing, civilized country that we're in today and what it is gradually becoming, and not so gradually anymore. Um, it says in uh, Proverbs 14.34, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach, a reproach to any people. Principle number six, common decency. All right, A belief that a decent nation is made up of decent people. Again, the Bible says uh, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We have, we, as Bible believers, we get that drummed into us. We're nothing, we're nothing, we're nothing. But if we're born again, we're, we're something. You know, We are a precious soul in God's eyes, whether we're saved or not. He created every soul. And that would be good for us Bible believers to keep that in mind. Keep it in mind when you're upset with some charismatic or some Calvinist or some Lutheran or Jehovah's Witness, uh, whether they're saved or lost, they're still a soul and precious in God's sight. And uh, some of these souls at some of these uh, charismatic churches, could be a Catholic church, there's saved people in all these other denominations as well. A lot of them, uh, none of them probably using the King James Bible, and they don't know any better. And uh, don't disassociate with them in terms of uh, breaking fellowship. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, maybe I shouldn't have said it that way. A fellowship, having a close relationship with somebody is one thing. But, you know, you continue to pray for them. They are precious in God's eyes. And they can become, uh, if they get born again, who knows? They may never accept the King James Bible as the final authority in their lives. They may never do anything for the Lord but they are precious in his sight, okay? So you have to be very careful about being judgmental about other people. Um, 
Anyway, tolerate without compromising, I guess would be my advice. Listen, a common decency, uh, Americans have worked to feed the world's poor, to clothe the naked, to aid the hurting. Americans have opened their arms to as many of the world's oppressed and given them a the safe haven. Why do you think we have that Statue of Liberty? We were given that from, the nation, from France because of the way we encouraged others to come to this country legally, <laughs> right? Uh, we get this from Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine: 39, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Chances of James 1, 27, pure religion and undefiled before God is this to uh, visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. You know, that's a biblical principle. We get common decency. Number seven, and this shocked me when I realized this was part of the Judeo-Christian ethic, our personal accountability to God. Perhaps the greatest restraint against acts of evil toward others is the knowledge that every person and nation will one day give an account for their actions to Almighty God. That's from our Bible. Okay? The Bible says that poor man to man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. Daniel Webster, great American statesman, was asked once, what is the most sobering thought that ever entered your mind? He quickly responded, my personal accountability to God. These guys knew that. They knew one day they were going to stand before God and give an account. And for those of you that are familiar with my ministry, uh, I usually have a pottery studio behind me, and I'm making pottery the whole time I'm preaching, and hope to do for that for you maybe later uh, this year sometime. Uh, but my emphasis of all of my messages, and it kind of will be today as well, is Christians preparing for the judgment seat of Christ. You and I are going to give an account one day. We're going to stand before the creator of all things, and he may be asking us point blank, point blank, what have you done for me since the day I saved your soul? He may say that to us. That is a sobering thought. The Bible says we will give an account as to the works we've done, as to what sort they are, what were our motives for those works. I don't want to get sidetracked because that's not the emphasis of the message here. But this is part of the Judeo-Christian ethic, and it's definitely part of our King James Bible. One day we will give an account. So, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Sunday school, we've got to get some Bible verses in here. First Corinthians chapter 3, we're talking about the foundation of our country. And it says, First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, and this is preface, he's prefacing the judgment seat of Christ here. It says in verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Down in verse 12, he says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. Fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. That's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. That word day in the first clause of verse 13, that's a specific reference to the judgment seat of Christ. Your works, my works, our good works that we allow the Lord Jesus Christ to do for us during the days of our salvation will be judged one day. They'll go through a spiritual fire and they're going to come out as gold, silver, precious stones if they're done in his strength while we are abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if not, they'll come out as wood, hay, and stubble. And that's as far as I want to go with that. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Again, I'm not preaching on the judgment seat of Christ, but I, one of the things I love about my pastor, uh, I call him my pastor, the church I go to down in Port St. Lucie, Pastor Aaron Hunter, um, raise your hand if you went to the uh, passed out tracks at your parade a month or so ago. Okay, so was Pastor Hunter up here for that? So you know Pastor Hunter. Um, I, I, just because it's at the forefront of his mind, like it should be for all Christians, I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ, I very seldom am in a church on a Sunday listening to Pastor Hunter preach where two or three times he just doesn't mention the judgment seat of Christ. He's not preaching about it, but he just mentions it because that is the big doctrine that awaits us. That's when we're going to give an account. That's when the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord willing, will be passing out some rewards, some earned rewards at that judgment seat of Christ. Anyway, I don't want to get off on that. I keep uh, drifting in that direction. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, the Bible says, 
uh, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and uh, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So I know I'm kind of taking this out of context, but he's talking about the foundation being the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So I, I drew this ahead of time. Maybe this will help. Because here's what I want to... I want to talk about the United States is founded upon the Judeo-Christian ethic, okay? That Judeo-Christian ethic is founded upon the principles we get in our AV 1611 Bible. And that Bible is founded on the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the way, it's almost hard to separate these two because he is the Word of God, the capital W. So that's kind of a, what I'm getting at in the Sunday School Hour. Not only is Jesus Christ the foundation, but he's a special part of that foundation. He's the chief cornerstone. And I won't have you go to 1 Peter, where it also mentions the same thing, that he's the cornerstone. And Peter's actually quoting a verse from Isaiah, which says, says that he is the chief cornerstone. So uh, that's the principle I, I want us to get. And it's too bad that young people can't get a hold of this. So I do want to read uh, what some other founding fathers had to say about some of these things. So here's, let's see, 659 Morris, about this foundation, about the Bible, the importance of that in our society. Um, 659. If you remember, if you've ever heard of Morris Code, I know Dutch has. Um, his father was named Jedediah Morris. Jedediah Morris, the father of Samuel Morris, who the inventor of the telegraph and Morris Code. Uh, Jedediah Morris lived in from the, the mid-1700s to the early 1800s. Okay? He's a graduate student at Yale. He's called the father of American geography. And while at Yale, he studied for the ministry, okay? Because that's what Yale was doing back then, turning out preachers, if you can believe it. He was highly alarmed. This is in 1790. He was highly alarmed by how far the Boston clergy had moved away from doctrinal orthodoxy, as well as by the growing influence of European rationalism. <laughs> and I don't know, you could say Marxism, you could say humanism, you could plug in all kinds of things. He said this, our dangers are of two kinds, those which affect our religion and those which affect our government. They are, however, so closely allied that they cannot, without propriety, be separated. The foundations which support the interest of Christianity are also necessary to support a free and equal government like our own. To the kindly influence of Christianity, we owe that degree of civil freedom and political and social happiness which mankind now enjoys. In proportion as the genuine effects of Christianity are diminished in any nation, either through unbelief or corruption of its doctrine or the neglect of its institutions, in the same proportion will the people of that nation recede from receiving the blessings of genuine freedom and approximate the miseries of complete despotism. He's saying, you know, to summarize that a little bit, the more we follow these principles, the more we're going to live a blessed life in this country and have as a nation. But the more we back away from them, and that's what's been happening. And we've gotten to that point now where they're past the point of no return, I believe. I hold this to be a truth confirmed by experience. If so, it follows that all efforts made to destroy the foundations of our holy religion ultimately tend to the subversion also of our political uh, freedom and happiness. Whenever the pillars of Christianity shall be overthrown, our present Republican forms of government and all the blessings which flow from them must fall with them. In summary, to put it in my terms, the farther we stray from these principles that are established here, the farther we're going to stray from God's blessings. Okay? That's Samuel Morris. Uh, I got a quote here from Woodrow Wilson, 643. Let's see here. One of the presidents of the United States. Uh, he was actually president right during, uh, right after World War I, okay? 
Um, and he gave this speech in 1911, he, before he was actually president, because uh, that was from 1913 to 1921. He said this, this is Woodrow Wilson. Every Sunday school should be a place where the, this great book is not only opened, is not only studied, is not only received, but is drunk of, as it were, a fountain of life. <laughs> is used as if it were the only source of inspiration and guidance. No great nation can ever survive its own temptations and its own follies that does not indoctrinate its children in the word of God. So that as a schoolmaster and a governor, I know, and that's what he was before he was elected president, he was a governor and a schoolmaster, I know that my feet must rest within the feet of my fellow men upon this foundation, and upon the foundation only, this foundation only, for the righteousness of a nation, like the righteousness of men, must take its source from these foundations of inspiration. I'm talking about these holy scriptures. Uh, let me give you one more here. Seven nineteen. This is a guy named Ames. Um, again, someone I hadn't heard of before. Most of these guys I quote from here are were high up in our government. Uh, Fisher Ames lived uh, from 1750 to 1800, basically. He's a founder and politician who helped formulate the Bill of Rights. Okay, uh, He said this, We have a dangerous trend beginning to take place in our education. We're starting to put more and more textbooks into our schools. You see, they used to have, this was the textbook. <laughs> you know, I went to a Bible school in Pensacola 20 years ago. This was the textbook. It's the only textbook they had. Uh, so he said, uh, we're starting to put more and more textbooks into our schools. We've become accustomed of late of putting little books in the hands of children containing fables and moral lessons. We are spending less time in the classroom on the Bible, which should be the principal text of our schools. The Bible states these great moral lessons better than any other man-made book. What's he saying? He's saying, He's recognizing this book isn't man-made. And God might have used men to compile it, but God is the one that made this book. It's not just a book. I got another guy who's actually a, uh, I won't read him, he's a, an ambassador from Lebanon to this country and he, back in the, in the 50s, so less than 70 years ago. Actually, in 1960, he made this statement about America is the, the Bible is the soul of this country. The Bible, the Word of God, is the soul of this country. That's him as an outsider saying that. So, you know, we've been given liberty. This is more of what I'm going to get into the worship service. We have a tremendous liberty still in this country. And the question is, are you going to take advantage of that liberty? I want to give you a, a couple, three examples of some men that you may recognize uh, who took advantage of the liberty in this country. So here's one. His name is Samuel Colgate. Sound familiar? He uh, is the philanthropist of what has become the Colgate Palmolive Company. Lived in 1822 to 1897. So he's been gone a long time. But his, country, his company was incredibly successful. I mean, it's still around today. He said, the only spiritual light in the world comes through Jesus Christ and the inspired capital B book. Okay? Redemption and forgiveness of sin alone through Christ. Without his presence and the teachings of the Bible, we would be enshrouded in moral darkness and despair. <laughs> That's a successful businessman that took advantage of the liberty of this country, but also took advantage and ran his life, lived his life, according to the principles in this book. And God blessed him for that. I just recently read a biography of Mike Green. He's the founder of Hobby Lobby. Same thing. A Christian man who started with nothing, they're actually opening a Hobby Lobby every two weeks right now. And I don't know if they've got 200 and some stores or around 300 stores or whatever, but just because he's a, he believes in God and God has blessed him for his faithfulness. Um, probably not using the King James Bible, probably not a dispensationalist, all kinds of things, but he's still a precious soul. Uh, how, about, how about someone you've heard of, George Washington Carver? Um, He's the guy that uh, discovered more than 300 uses for peanuts and hundreds more for soybeans, pecans, and sweet potatoes. He said this, I'm just going to read briefly, he, was, he realized that man who needs a purpose and a mission 
to keep him alive had one. That was his philosophy. God gave him a purpose, a mission. Here is a black man who, born right at the time, around the time of the Civil War, so lived most of his life during the, between 1900 and 1940, and very successful back then when very few black men were. I know I did a meeting in Iowa a couple years ago, and he was born in one of those little cities, I believe, in Iowa. He became a professor at, in Alabama, Tuskegee Institute or something like that. He considered himself God's co-worker. He said, my purpose alone must be God's purpose, to increase the welfare and happiness of his people. All of us are called to be God's co-workers. Here's one more. Henry John Hines started helping his mother tend a small garden at the age of six. Started selling vegetables, making deliveries to little stores in Pittsburgh. Today, the Heinz Company sells more than 1,300 products worldwide, ranging from ketchup, Heinz ketchup, to baby food. He was deeply involved in the promotion of Sunday school in Pittsburgh. In his will, Heinz said, I desire to set forth at the very beginning of this will as the most important item in it, a confession of my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I also desire to bear witness to the fact that throughout my life, in which there were unusual joys and sorrows, I have been wonderfully sustained in my faith in God through Jesus Christ. This legacy was left me by my consecrated mother, a woman of strong faith, and I to it, I attribute any success I have attained. He's giving his success not to his mother, if you understand that correctly, but to the principles she helped establish in him, helped show him through the word of God. So, uh, I think we'll wait to get into this next book until the worship service, but listen, I'll just leave you with this. God had a purpose in establishing this country. And when the pilgrims left Great Britain or wherever they were in England over there, uh, when they left, I, I think they tried for a while to go just across the channel to one of the Scandinavian countries. Again, I don't know history. Dutch knows it all. Uh, but that wasn't far enough. And that wasn't God's purpose. God's purpose was to use those pilgrims to get them to this new land so because God wanted to use them to spread the gospel. And we are in that country right now, and we still have the liberty to get out there and spread the gospel. And what we need to do is learn from history, and not be sucked into repeating the mistakes of history. We don't have to go with the flow of what's going on out there. Why don't we take advantage of the remaining days of our salvation, take advantage of the liberty we have in this country, and allow the Lord Jesus Christ to do something through us. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time you've given us during the Sunday School Hour. Lord, and I help as we continue to kind of talk about this subject, that you will help us uh, by your strength and by your grace to recognize the opportunities that you give us minute by minute to do things that not only please you, but things that glorify you. So I ask you to continue to bless the hearers of the word this morning and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you. I guess we're going to take about a 10-minute break.